Good evening, welcome everyone uh, to this event on uh, Tower Hamlet's uh, new really innovative um, supplementary planning document on high density living. Um, thanks for joining. My name's Roland Channon Morris. I'm on the uh, Academy uh, Steering Committee. Um, before we start, just some some housekeeping. So we'll we'll be recording the event tonight, uh, and it'll be posted um, afterwards on the Academy YouTube channel. We're going to have a short, uh, some fifteen minute presentation, um, and afterwards um, a question and answer session. Um, so please uh, post your questions or comments in the chat box, um, and I'll then invite uh, um, questioners to. To ask a question to our speakers, um, and then I just um, unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, so our speakers tonight are Luthia Serrada, who's um, the High Density Development Project Manager at Tower Hamlets Council and is an architect, um, urban designer, and academic. Was also uh, part of the first uh, public practice cohort. Um, and Becky Mumford, who's an urban planner and designer uh, in the Tower Hamlets Place Shaping Team um, and uh, is uh, a planner and designer. So I'm going to hand over to Becky and Lucia. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. So um, Becky will share the presentation. So we have um, Lucia. Sorry, yeah. Is, my my internet went funny for a second. I'll just start sharing. Perfect. Thanks. So uh, we have structured the presentation in two parts. Uh, I'll start with a bit of the introduction, uh, how the project uh, was initiated, and and the context uh, in which uh, it sits in. And I'll talk a bit about the methodology we followed, and then Becky will go into uh, more the, the details of the findings and how through the supplementary planning document we are trying to address uh, those findings. So before we move into the next slide, um, we just wanted to sort of talk a bit about uh, how the project was um, conducted. So basically it was an in-house um, a led project. This means that usually local authorities, or in many instances, a local authorities outsource a, these sort of projects to consultants. In this case, we, we kept it in-house, so we wrote the, the project brief, we did all the evidence gathering, uh, we analyzed the data, and then we produced the, the SPD. And um, I think this is important for many different reasons, but some of them are like in the first place that by having it done in-house, we could build on um, existing knowledge of different services. So it's a lot of uh, expertise uh, and intel in, you know, for example, the waste team or the children's uh, uh, service. So we could tap into those and at the same time understand what the gaps were. So I think uh, we, by doing that, we, we identified gaps that then we uh, filled with a particular sort of uh, outsourcing to consultants, for example, for environmental modeling, and then I think finally it was a very um, agile process. So we were an iterative process. So we were able to go to you know, colleagues within the council, understand the gaps, sort of formulate the, the responses and, and that you know, helped to, to build, I think, a quite a successful um, sort of final piece of work. And finally, I think it was understanding uh, how the development management process works or how the, the negotiations with developers happen and sort of try to identify what are the, the weaknesses uh, currently in the system. So it's not only the SPD that we have uh, put together, but also we have identified other tools and, and mechanisms that uh, the local authority will need to use to make sure that we are delivering good quality high density development. So I think that was a bit of an introduction. And if we move into the next slide, I just wanted to talk about the context, and by context, I mean the geographical context. I think most of you are from the UK, but for those who are not familiar uh, with um, uh, London Tower Hamlets is one of the 32 local authorities that uh, form part of the great, greater London area. And it's uh, towards the east uh, of and north of the, of the Thames. And it's a local authority, which is the densest uh, in London and the UK, not only in the individual buildings, but 
some of the areas have some of the high then uh, the, the, the most dense densely populated and it's also very diverse um, so I think this diagram that we put together early on in the process show the, the trend in terms of the kind of applications that we received since 2000. So as you can see, there is a clear sort of a um, increase, not only in, in density, but also in height. And I think this also has to do with how the land is structured. So there is very fragmented. And, and that means that you know, if developers want to maximize development, in many instances, that means uh, tall buildings. So if we moved um, into the next slide, and this talks about the context in where the project sits. Uh, so basically, uh, as you may know, there, there have been like different uh, London plans that uh, have emerged or have been uh, approved since 2000. And there has been a shift uh, in terms of uh, how we approach uh, you know, the, 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 um, the planning of, of density. So from a very, quantitative sort of approach where you had like a density metrics setting maximum thresholds to a more qualitative approach. And basically the new London plan, what it says is that, you know, we shouldn't be talking about numbers and we should be having a design led approach. And through design, we could be mitigating any of the, you know, negative impacts uh, that high density uh, can cause. So I think that's that's where this, pro this project sits, like it's trying to address that sort of design-led a new approach. So we'll move into the next slide. So basically, if you know how the planning system works in the, in the UK, uh, developments were assessed on the basis of a townscape uh, assessment. So looking at you know, the impact on, on the, the skyline or protected views and also a environmental impact assessment. So understanding of what the impact in the surroundings in the surroundings uh, was in terms of uh, uh, daylight sunlight. But from the council, there was the feeling that we didn't understand what it meant to live in, in those sort of environments. So how families uh, inhabit uh, these buildings or experience these buildings, or what would be the impact uh, in the long term, for example, in, in, in light of the climate change, um, but also you know, how these buildings are managed. So I think that the, the scope of the project was to uh, try and understand what the experience of, of people living, but also working in there was. Um, and then also try to bring some transparency to the process. So, you know, negotiations usually happen behind closed doors, basically. So I think it was important for us to try and bring all the stakeholders together and, and try to build as much as possible a consensus around what good design means. And we were trying to move away from that sort of more aesthetic sort of assessment and, and more of sort of going into the experiences of, of residents and, and the, the impact in their, in their quality of life. So if we move to the next one. So I think that one of the first things we did was um, a literature review or, or a review of what, was, what has been published uh, recently in terms of, a, of this topic. And we found that there was a huge uh, gap in, in our opinion in, in understanding yeah, what, what was the life in these in this sort of buildings. It, there was a gap in terms of extreme densities that we were seeing in Tower Hamlets, because we are talking about like 5,000 habitable roof per hectare, which is five times higher than what is isn't currently you know, accepted as, as a um, high in the current London plan. So it's, you know, these were extreme uh, densities. But also we felt there was a, a lack of sort of um, a research, a making sure that a, when you talk to residents, you are capturing different sort of a, individuals. So usually previous research, you know, had a very low response rate if they went, you know, through a residence a survey, for example. And also by using certain a, methods of engagement like online and, and postal, you were living outside certain uh, fractions of the of the population and demographics that were important. So we invested a lot of time and resources to conduct a, a post occupancy evaluation uh, across different buildings. So if you move to the next slide, and this is a, a framework. So these are the case studies basically that we we uh, um, uh, analyzed in detail. So we looked at desktop analysis of the the planning documentations, but also we spoke with residents and developers, architects, all the different stakeholders involved in the process. And 
we were we captured uh, buildings that were uh, relatively new. So the eldest one was completed in 2005, and all of them had to be occupied for at least two years. So just trying to make sure that we were capturing um, meaningful data. And this diagram shows how we came about um, choosing those nine case studies. So we selected different densities, thresholds, different heights, and also we tried to make sure that we were uh, including different building typologies. So from example, from a standalone tower to a tower sitting on a podium or a perimeter block. And this was trying to sort of acknowledge that density can be accommodated in different ways and, and the uh, challenges, but also opportunities are very specific. Um, so yeah, that was quite important in how we um, selected those case studies. So if you go to the next one. So as I said, to sort of try and understand uh, the experiences of people living and working there, we conducted a resident survey and it was a door to door. So we had a consultant, you know, we gave them very specific quotas around uh, different areas of the building. They had to speak with people living, you know, from the top to the bottom, uh, looking, you know, um, having a, a north facing flat or dual aspect, uh, different tenures. So from private to uh, uh, affordable, and uh, also gender. And so we managed to gather more than 1,000 responses, which is a 40% response rate compared to previous survey that only uh, hit 4%. So it was, we were really uh, happy with you know, the amount of data we, 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 we gathered. But we followed up also with interviews, with a, a one hour a long interview with a 50 of the residents. And that was quite important because through the survey, we started to see certain trends, but we sort of uh, failed to understand maybe some of the more qualitative elements. So through those uh, conversations, we, we managed to get uh, a better understanding. And then we had workshops with different stakeholders with, within the council and outside the council. And what it was very informative with, uh, it was um, we conducted site visit with building managers. So they took us around uh, the building a sort of pointing to the different you know, challenges and issues that they were facing, in particular antisocial behavior sometimes. Um, and that was very, very important for, the, for this uh, project. And then we also, as I said, outsourced uh, environmental modeling sort of to try and understand how different areas of the building were um, performing in terms of you know, daylight sunlight, overheat, etc. And so after we gathered all that data, we started analyzing it and we came uh, we sort of identify five main topics. Um, so children and young people, mixed and balanced communities, everyday life, buildings and systems, and healthy neighborhoods. And Becky will go into some of the findings. Um, so, so yeah, I'll run through each of the five topics and key findings from the research process. So the first was children and young people, which you thought was uh, really key for Tower Hamlets as it's a very young borough with the fourth youngest population in the UK. Um, we were finding throughout the development management process that, that developers were frequently insisting that families weren't living in high density schemes, particularly private schemes, which we found not to be the case. So 34% of those we surveyed uh, were living with children. And that did vary by tenure. So it rose to 50% for affordable homes and 20% for private rented. And well, 20% private rented and 24% owner occupied. Uh, we found families weren't typically living in a family home, which is divide, defined as three bedroom plus. There were instances of families living in room, um, homes as small as studios and one bedrooms with one or more children. And we also asked questions on where their children play and whether it was supervised or unsupervised. And most families were playing unsupervised, sorry, playing supervised. Um, which we found from development, child development experts can be detrimental to childhood development and independence. We asked why, and it was generally safety of spaces or that these were too far from homes. Across the case studies we looked at, rooftop spaces were almost universally closed if they were used for play due to antisocial behavior issues and difficulties in managing the space. 
So the second topic, mix and balance communities sought to understand social integration and community cohesion as how Hamlets is one of the di most diverse boroughs in the UK. 34% felt there was community feel within their building compared to the London average of 45%. So this was assessed against tenure, income and ethnicity. And we found that owner occupiers, higher earners and white residents were actually least likely to feel a sense of community in the building. So in case studies where communal space was provided, 45% used the spaces and 30% interacted with their neighbors there. We also, in a survey of residents around high density homes, asked if they felt their neighborhood had a sense of community. In Isle of Dogs, 21%, Isle of Dogs is, for people who are not from London, is where Canary Wharf is located and where Tower Hamlets has got a big cluster of tall buildings. Um, so 21% said there was a sense of community to compared to a London average of 71%. We also asked people around the buildings whether residents of the high density schemes were part of their community. 64% said no, but we saw a very stark difference in response depending on the case study. So in one, so this is mask maker, 92% said that residents of this building were part of their community. But Pan Peninsula, which was it's about 300 meters further away, 82% said they weren't part of their community, which really shows factors such as tenure and typology and design impacting social cohesion and sense of community in a neighborhood. So everyday life sought to understand the day-to-day -day needs of residents um, to ensure that they can carry out everyday activities with ease and live long-term, even if circumstances change, for example, aging or poor health. Whilst many were satisfied with living in high density, some raised issues with flexibility, for example, small second bedrooms, or awkward internal layouts where it was difficult to configure furniture in more than one way. Whilst the survey was conducted before coronavirus and before the working from home accelerated, we did speak to a lot of researchers on home working and they were very keen that we pushed back at the assumption that home working was limited to a desk with examples of various types of work, including childminding here or things like beauty therapy, which can be both a challenge spatially, but also with restrictions on tenancy agreements. So with the survey, 67% of residents said that they did think that they had enough storage in their home. But this is a good example of what Lucia said previously about interviews, finding, yeah, really exploring issues. And through interviews, lack of storage was probably one of the biggest challenges residents felt with many saying that they were having to use external storage or keep items in other people's homes. So we also, through everyday life, asked about washing and drying of clothes. And it's due to small home sizes and open plan living, room, living rooms and living spaces, washing machines and clothes drying in the middle can cause quite a bit of disturbance and disruption to everyday activities and damp in some of the less well ventilated case studies. So buildings as systems looks at sustainability, the circular economy and building management. So building management was particularly the presence of a concierge was frequently identified as one of the main benefits residents found of living in at high density, but it varied a lot by tenure. We found that schemes were most successful when developers continued to manage buildings or if one company managed both tenants. So this also covered waste and case studies had a, a big mix of waste management schemes. So we didn't directly question or cover rates of recycling, but we found from interviews that in two of the case studies, they weren't separating waste at all, um, which was causing a bit of stress for residents. Um, they, we also found that waste rooms could be quite unpleasant and there was a big issue with bulky waste taking up space and also many instances where waste rooms were accessed just off the lift and rather than losing the lift residents would 
just throw their waste from directly from the lift into the waste room to avoid losing the lift and having to stay down in the basement for longer than they needed. We also found cycle rates were very, very low. Um, of those that did cycle, many kept their bikes in their homes because access and safety of cycle stores could be poor. But however, we found that cycle stores were for many an in instances where they did get to know their neighbors. And the final topic, healthy neighborhoods sport, thought to holistically explore environment, environmental parameters, which we developed in support through support from environmental consultants that modeled the case studies. So overheating was a particular problem um, and balconies were often praised, but keeping windows and doors open had to be balanced with noise issues and case studies that were near, for example, the DLR line or larger roads. And privacy, we found from privacy, privacy was generally more of a challenge within a particular development. So in a courtyard, for example, rather than between two different buildings or different developments. Yeah, uh, so we used all of these case studies and the findings as a sort of theme through the SPD. So any questions, be happy to answer them, but thanks. Thank you. Can I just kick off with one? Um, I'd be curious to hear more about sort of the, because it's, it's obviously a, a big piece of research done um, in house in, in Tower Hamlets, which I think is really interesting. Um, so just to hear more about kind of the team uh, that fed into this, this, the kind of mix of skills that you had and um, what, what, uh, what the experience was like of uh, doing something like this in house and maybe what that kind of, um, what lessons from that uh, might might uh, come for other local authorities? Yeah, so I think the local authority was interested in carrying this piece of work for a long time. Um, but you know, uh, local authorities are quite overstretched, and um, so they didn't have the resources to to do it. So I think through public practice, they sort of. Um, Thought that you know it could be a good opportunity to get someone only working on on this and and that was me and i joined them um to deliver this piece of work and uh, so the team was a uh, myself and and becky and we sit in the in the play shaping team so basically that's where the design um, expertise lays in the in the local authority so that's you know it had a, an important sort of design element and but we are you know next to other teams like infrastructure a plan making, so they want to do policy. So we and, and development management, and so we benefited from you know those close sort of conversations uh, with with colleagues. Um, uh, I think yeah, the expertise was I'm I'm an architect, so there was the the design element there, and Becky is a planner, so you know I think we we were, we were a good team. <laughs> yeah, to sort of like write policy that I had never done before. Um, and then we, we obviously outsource uh, some bits and pieces to certain consultants. Uh, but, but yeah, I think um, it's not something that local authorities or our local authority often does, but I think they have seen the benefit of it. And I think, you know, searching for more opportunities to try and, 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 and do this kind of projects, it's hugely uh, beneficial. Um, I'm not sure you want to add anything else, Becky? No, I think that covers it. Yeah. I think so. Sort of following on from that, I think Charlotte um, has, has a question about the cost. Yeah. So the cost uh, carry out the whole project. Um, I mean, apart from my salary, <laughs> my <laughs> salary, I think uh, so. We 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 got a contract. So talking about the outsourcing bits, that what that was the the only cost so we had a consultant doing the the actual field work so knocking on doors and that was key fundamental because it was a a, a company based in tower hamlet they had done research before there so they knew you know that there is a very diverse community so it's not only english the language for example you need to be using if you want to engage with different people so it was a uh, quite important and I think the the total cost for the for the whole you know survey and interviews was around a uh, 20k and and then we had the um, environmental consultant. I can't remember the cost, but you know it was another substantial you know 
a sort of piece of, of, of the budget. Um, and then we had a graphic designer helping us with the final element of it. I have to say that, you know, for the project, uh, we had support from the GLA. So we bid for the home capacity, home building capacity. And they, you know, they supported us uh, with, with some um, funding. So I think that's how we sort of managed to, you know, carry out an ambitious project, but sort of trying to minimize the cost for the local authority. Yeah, I guess to add to that on staffing, I think the Home Building Capacities Fund covered your salary and then I sort of yeah. jumped in and, in and out. Mm. I think Patrick, Patrick, you have a question about the definition of family homes? Yeah, yeah. that was really straightforward. It's just, is it two bed or three? Because occupation different in, um, you know, depending on public, private. So if you say a bit about what how Hamlet's considered to be a family home and what you found was the reality. Yeah. So as Becky said, family homes in policy are defined as three beds or three plus. Beds. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. I think there were discussions in the New London plan of a sort of a, including two beds as family homes, but I don't think that has, a, you know, you know, it was discussed but not adopted. So it's three beds. So as we know, lots of people bring up families in two bed homes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Including me, two yeah. children, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But um, the, the occupancy is massively different usually between private and yeah. affordable. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what we found is in the private side, there were lots of families, like more than fifty percent of them, living studios, one beds and two beds. So yeah, that was a, an important finding for the project. Yeah, and I think that has kind of fed back into some of the housing team within Tower Hamlets and yeah, how important these smaller homes are. That's, that's great. Um, just having to make a distinction quite often uh, in, in, I'm an architect in, in daily life between high density and overcrowding. Yeah. You know, yeah. They're not the same thing. You know, you, people can be low, yeah. overcrowded in low density areas and, and live well in high density areas. Yeah. Uh, it's slightly under addressed, I think, by the planning system, but I don't know yeah. how you change that. I, I agree, yeah. And I think with the COVID-19 sort of debate that has come up quite clearly, the importance of overcrowding and, you know, you can see in, in Tower Hamlets, but also Newham, the, there is a lot of overcrowding, as you were saying, different sort of uh, types of housing, like low density, high density. So it's a problem across uh, different types of um, urban fabrics. Yeah, completely agree. Thank you. Christopher, you had a question about uh, requiring requirements for post-occupancy surveys. Yeah, we are, we are glad that you're asking <laughs> that question because so this came up as, you know, really key. So this is just one off exercise and, and we really want this to be embedded in the, in the planning system. So we have worked closely with um, colleagues from infrastructure. There is a new section 106 SPD that is being consulted on. And we have pushed uh, for it to be adopted. And I think there were lots of issues around uh, privacy and, and legal um, concerns from the local authority. So uh, unfortunately, I don't think in this iteration of the, of the Section 106 SPD is going to be adopted. But uh, we think there is, a, there is the understanding that this is important. And I think RIB, the RIBA you know, is doing a bit of work on that. Also, I think. GLA might start uh, looking into this. So I think, you know, in the in the short term, you know, local authorities need to uh, try and embed this because I think developers are carrying out their own uh, post-occupancy evaluations, but it's important that the methodology and the questions we are asking are the same. Um, so, so yeah, I totally agree. It should be funded through section 106 and we should be doing it throughout, you know, across the different developments. Uh, Julie, did you want to ask your question? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, no, I, I just had a question on like, you know, how the government is obsessed with design codes and how they're going to be like the magical answer to like, you know, securing high quality when they're completely deregulating the system and 
and how for you a design a design uh, guide like the one you've produced compares to a design code especially you know like design codes they they, they have to be quite site specific and i think for places like tower hamlets that are like so densely populated where the um, the, the plots of land are quite small i just don't think that design codes can work but a design code a design guide like the one you've produced like is good mm -hmm. and so for like a, a board wide approach so yeah just uh, wondering if in the light of the planning reform um you had had some discussions around the future role of the of this design guide okay do you want to work again well it's more the stuff that we're doing at the moment discussing mm. Yeah, so I don't feel like I can give a good argument yet because it's literally it's the uh, stuff that our team, our strategic planning, are talking about and responding to this week, next week. Yeah, but but I do agree that as you know, the only tool is not is not it won't solve the issue. You know, because we were, for example, in this design guideline, even is is very different from a design code. It still is quite limited because. There is such a variety of you know context and uh, you know uh, application that producing one document that addresses all the different issues is just impossible. So it needs to be. I, I was going to say vague. <laughs> it's not vague, but flexible. But it's, at the end, it's quite vague. So I think there should be other uh, tools and control mechanisms to make sure that the development, you know, and and, and the city grows, you know, um, well. So yeah. Um, Um, Andrew, did you want to ask your question about the impact on planning policy? Hi, if you can hear me. Um, it was simply that uh, how, how after this uh, report's been done, and it's a very interesting one, thank you. Uh, what chats are taking place within uh, Tower Hamlets and how do you see this impacting on uh, uh, local planning uh, policy? Um, so we hope, what we hope with this document is that there is some consistency in the way schemes are assessed through the process. I think up until now, it was very, you know, down to individuals and individual officers or architects or developers to sort of push, pursue one of other you know, different objectives or, or you know, uh, weight different design elements, um, you know, in a different way. So I think through this, we are trying to sort of get like a consistent sort of approach and, and a sort of like discussion guide that all officers, applicants and architects have to follow to make sure that we are, you know, uh, assessing these buildings holistically. But, you know, this is an, an SPV, so it's not policy, it's just, you know, a guidance. So it's, it's material consideration. It builds on the current local plan, which says that, you know, high density and tall buildings have to be exceptionally well designed. So this is just, you know, a, an, an exercise of sort of saying, okay, and by good design or exceptional design, we mean this. Um, I guess it's worth adding in terms of Tower Hamlets and our planning policy context. We very recently, 2019, adopted our new local plan. So that will run to, yeah, for quite a while. But also this work and, well, on high density is, I guess, linked to your, the second project that Lucy is now working on, on tall buildings, which I guess it's more directly related to the local plan because that will provide some guidance on uh, tall building zones that are part of our planning policy desi yeah. land designations. Mm. So I think this SPD deals with individual buildings and, and the new piece of work we are working on now, it's more sort of a, a strategic, so tall building zones. And I think how the, your question is how it, will be in, how it will impact planning policy. I also think that, you know, in the new London plan, uh, when they talk about um, tall buildings, they talk about the visual impact, which I think we were already assessing and is, would it still be there. But they also talk about the functional element, which I think it's it's key, and we are you know hanging on to that functional uh, sort of concept to try and you know make sure that we are looking at how these buildings work uh, in more detail and trying to embed that into into policy. Heather, uh, you had a question about. Uh, benchmarks and, and learnings from other places? Yeah, I mean, we really 
loft and, and you know, and look with, you know, uh, quite detail. And we got in contact with the Toronto uh, planning team because they have a very interesting piece of work in um, children and high density. Uh, they also are producing now a piece of work on pets in high density, which we found very fascinating. And we try to embed some of those in, in our SPD, but you know, we received quite a big pushback. Um, and I think so uh, our team leader in the in the council, he sort of conducted a research on, on high density in different countries. So he went to Canada and the States, but also uh, to, to China and uh, to Hong Kong. So I think, you know, we, we had a broad understanding of, you know, or broad, and we had an understanding of the type of uh, types of developments that are emerging uh, in different places. And we also had to be very sort of mindful of the cultural differences and, and that was you know, uh, always in our conversations. Um, Henry, did you want to ask your question about managing the impact of tenure and typology on, on sense of community? Sure, hello. Um, in, thank you for your presentation, um, it was great. In, in it, you showed two different tool buildings, one of which you said lots of people felt like that there was a sense of community and the other they didn't. Um, did you find any solutions regarding that? Because I imagine into the future you'll want to accept uh, applications for buildings that would create a sense yeah. of community rather than the latter. Do you want to take it or I can? You can start and I'll yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think um, an important part of the SSPB is to sort of recognize the importance of typologies. And and I think, you know, and, and when we went out for consultation, people were saying like, you're asking for too much, you know, this is a super long and complex uh, document. And so we refined it just to make it clear that we think, you know, if, if you choose a typology that works well, uh, you know, uh, you are addressing most of the issues and probably ticking most of the design recommendations that we are making. And so for, for us, you know, having standalone towers are very problematic because the only way you have to provide communal amenity spaces are on rooftops or internalized. So that's that's a typology that we are trying to fight back, not fight back, but you know, a sort of a point the, the, the limitations of that typology. Where while in you know if you have a tower on a sitting on a podium or in a in a courtyard, you are creating the natural sort of a um, environment for having communal amenity spaces that are closer to the ground, a, more easily connected to the lobby or entrance or the visibility from the entrance to the communal amenity space. The fact that the communal amenity space are on the way to your home, so you don't have to you know take a lift, go up, then walk along a corridor and to get to the communal amenity space, that was important. But also naturally, they would be more like better overlooked. Um, and, and so for example, you know, talking about the example that Mac Becky mentioned, the first one, it's a sort of like a tower sitting on a, on a perimeter block. So where there are two courtyards. So one of them, you know, it's uh, surrounded by family homes, like, you know, so families or children could, you know, easily access that co uh, communal amenity space. And the other one is open and well integrated with the existing street network. So you can see people going there from, you know, the, 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 the surroundings and playing with children. But also there is the, the a commune, um, um, community center in the heart of the development. So that drags people from around the development. And also it's a mainly affordable. So that means that, you know, the people that have moved in are people that lived in the local authority or around the area. And, and the other scheme was particularly bad because um, of many different reasons, but um, well, first of all, it's fully private. So that already creates a sort of like perception that, you know, those people that live in there um, have less a uh, connection with the existing community, uh, but also, for example, the location of the entrance away from, from the main streets, uh, the quality of the communal amenity space was is quite bad. So it's, it's very claustrophobic. It doesn't receive huge amounts of daylight sunlight. Um, yeah, even in that instance, is the rooftop space was meant to be a sort of public, well, open terrace, but that got converted into a bar. Um, yeah. yeah, 
So yeah, so I think is yeah, is the tenure and the typology we are like pushing for uh, courtiers and podiums. Um, we find that those are you know uh, better in achieving most of the main uh, objectives. Of our I guess to to add to that, um, as part of the infrastructure uh, section one hundred six. Um, SPD that we were talking about, we also raised the possibility of securing a neighborhood officer for these bigger buildings that would sort of work to link residents with yeah, spaces or groups around the building, but also, I guess, yeah, program events in communal spaces and things like that, that we were imagining could work, not necessarily one per building, but in a, in different areas as a cluster of buildings. But I don't know what happened with that. <laughs> to add to that, you said also that um, developers were saying that families weren't going to be living in these homes, but it turned out that they were anyway. Um, sometimes in terms of homes that weren't even meant for families. Um, might that mean it's probably worth um, Factoring in things like children's play space in in all developments, regardless of what they're planned for, um, to to cater for that end possibility. So that already there is already planning requirements for play space for all of these schemes. I think what we're finding was that they were often providing play space for younger families, but it was the larger space for. 12 plus that were often yeah being either delivered off site or we we were receiving financial contributions instead of developers providing them by themselves but i think being stronger on having those within schemes would probably be quite beneficial which yeah. hopefully the spd will yeah and on the play, yeah and on the play element i think it was quite interesting to see how families you know, children play everywhere. So, you know, um, recognizing that and also, you know, doorstep play. So when your the, the play space is quite far from your home, families end up using the corridor. So they let their children, you know, run along and, and meet their other, you know, friends in, in the same floor. And that was um, seen as, you know, quite important for, for families to, to let them, you know, uh, explore, but also quite problematic in some instances. So I think what we were trying to do also with these design guidance is to try and minimize a excessive, you know, a conflict between residents, improving the insulation of, of corridors, you know, making sure that we are using materials that are easy to keep and maintain. And so, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And, and usually um, there is a lot of um, pressure on, on space and, you know, making sure that play areas are well integrated with with other uses uh, communal amenity spaces and and that you know the design of communal amenity spaces are playable um, was also an important element of the SPD. Thanks um, I think Charlotte's just come in, read my mind and come up with the same question I was going to ask which is um, yeah the, the wider applicability of this research and how the evidence you've collected could be used more widely across London or disseminated um, or, or in other cities. Um, I think both, both in terms of the finding of the research and also the methods um, that you used to yeah. develop it. Yeah. Um, we have been in contact and trying to, you know, uh, present at different local authorities. And we've also had conversations with the GLA. And I think uh, they see a lot of value in this project and you know, it's quite early still, but I think, you know, there is a lot that could be learned from this project for London. And for the other places, I think um, definitely, I mean, the planning system is very different, but you know, we have relied in our own SPD in best practice from you know, you know, other countries in, in, in Europe mainly. And I think there is a lot of to be learned from, from yeah, one place to, to others. And maybe networking with officers from, from other countries would be ideal. Side visits <laughs> in the future. I mean, yeah, I think there is a lot of scope uh, and I think COVID-19 has pointed to the, you know, how fundamental designing, you know, these high density buildings um, better, um, you know, is so, yeah, we have, we hope for that to happen. Do we have any other questions?
Charlotte uh, says, do, do you think the London plan tour building policy could be improved based on your research? Um, I think, as I said, the functional word that is in there, it's, it's key. <laughs> so, um, I mean, yeah, it's a complete, but I think, for example, the move to design led approach and um, it's an interesting one. I think design is very important, but at the same time, not having the density metrics there anymore to deal with densities is, is a bit problematic. So there is now a gap between, you know, um, the moment when this London plan is adopted and we, we don't have a design metrics anymore and local authorities are able to respond, it's gonna be complicated because, you know, the, 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 the negotiations with developers are really difficult. They come with a crazy densities and, and, and the only way you have to fight it back is through, you know, design, which is quite subjective. So, so there is a lot of uh, complexity in there. And I think, yeah, the tall building policy, as I said, um, I think the functional uh, point makes it, you know, um, flexible in our understanding. Um, I guess to add to that, that policy included some reference to building management, which I think is really valuable as, and yeah, a lot of the issues that we found were beyond planning, beyond architecture, but to do with how these buildings are managed. So yeah, that's partly what we try to include in the SPD and hopefully in the revision since consultation in spring brings forward is yeah, some advice or guidance for management plans and managing to address some of the issues we found. Uh, the COVID-19 question. Are there any aspects you'd consider revisiting following COVID-19? Sorry, what is the question again? Ah, are there any what would you reconsider? Uh, we, I, well, in my opinion, I would have asked more questions around work from home. Um, I think that was something that we, yeah, we, all, we didn't even ask in the survey. It was more through interviews that came up. Um, I think in terms of the way we structured the survey, we covered a lot of the, the sort of challenges that COVID-19 would have highlighted. So yeah, yeah. space adaptability, mm. access to daylight, sunlight and ventilation. I think it's just we might find that the findings change a bit now. Yeah. As people mm. have think, it. So yeah. Yeah. But I think you, yeah, I agree with Becky that it has given us some sort of like um, extreme strength or you know um, you know it has uh, supported some of the policies that were maybe a, there was quite some resistance from developers and I think this has sort of flagged up how important uh, they are um, shall I move into the next one yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How could post open space be incorporated into planning legislation? Um, I think the only we we started having these uh, conversations in the council, and the only tool we found is a uh, using section one hundred six, securing some money to do it either ourselves or you know asking developers to do it under you know certain parameters, um, and we haven't explored any other options uh, interesting to see i guess the the so the gla is starting to embed it and ask for it in schemes that they fund yeah but i get we tower hamlets could do that for again our own schemes but it's yeah not really in planning legislation um and in terms of a correlation between very high densities and a resident satisfaction uh, it was interesting, but residents were in general satisfied and happy uh, living at high density. I think there were different reasons, uh, you know, a good location uh, in terms of transport. Um, it was highlighted as important. The fact that these developments were new, um, although you think about it, you know, in a few times they won't be new. So that's an element. Um, and I think there was a I think the, the main difference that we saw in terms of satisfaction had to do, uh, I think, with 
uh, typologies and the quality of you know, communal amenity space or having access to communal amenity space. Um, but also uh, the whole sort of functioning of the building. So for example, for elderly and, and, well, and, and families or lifts uh, you know, were, were an element that usually quite problematic because they, they break down, it takes a long time to fix them. So I think lots of people that we spoke with were looking to move somewhere else just to avoid the, you know, that disruption. Um, so the importance of management, it was quite key in satisfaction, resident satisfaction. Yeah, to add to that, I think from if I if you assess all of the nine case studies, I think it was the tall buildings as part of wider master plans or in areas where that were less dense, but generally it looked on a bit more favorably than ones where lots were very close together. Um, design solutions for storage and outdoor space. Um, Harvey, did you want to say more about that? Um, do you want me to go, Lucia? Uh, I thought they were going to ask the, the question. Oh. No? Yeah. Okay, yeah, the storage. I think it was difficult because we, the scope of the project really didn't deal with um, housing standards. So we, we had to work with what we have. Which is you yeah. Know, there's no scope in the SPD to demand any more than space standards. Yeah. So we we sort of try to address that through recommendations on a you know maxim uh, thinking about how to maximize opportunities for storage. You know, in areas where you know, uh, so for example, having walls that uh, stack so you can have like built like full on uh, built storage, or you know, making the most of. Um, higher parts of, of your home, like on top of the bathroom maybe to add some storage, but also like sort of pointing opportunities for com individual storage in communal areas. So car parking, uh, you know, usually there are a lot of, of leftover spaces that could be used for individual and, and communal storage. Um, yeah, and the other question I was- I guess that sort of storage is more common in some of the European examples yeah. we saw. Yeah. Then... Alina, did you want to say more about your question? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Alina and I'm from Israel. Um, so my question is, um, sometimes here I work in a municipality and people are not so a fan of mix of development or uh, um, just um, community to community life. Maybe some people just wanna um, live in a private building with a gated uh, with a gate uh, in front of the building with a private um, um, private space and so on. So, how? Well, first, what were the were there like issues like that that you saw in the survey? That maybe wasn't uh, same as the issues that you were thinking about, and how did you dealt with that? Um, in the survey, we didn't ask about whether. Um, well, I don't think we asked whether they were interested in. Well, yes, we did, and I think the the question the the survey is always more tricky because we asked whether they were uh, having interactions with with neighbors in the communal amenity spaces, and it was really low. But we didn't ask whether they were looking for more or less. So I think it was through like workshops with residents, talking with them and, and with, with children that we understood that some of them, you cannot talk about, you know, all of them, but, but most of them were interested in, you know, getting to know their neighbors and having chances uh, to do so. So um, I think, you know, have, making sure that community spaces are accessed uh, for different tenures was important. Um, and also play, like we have seen many examples of segregated play in the in the UK, and we found that also in in, in some of the, our case studies. So um, I think residents were quite, you know, keen on uh, meeting their neighbors and having those chances. But I think yes. again, yes, sorry. we um 
tried to structure the SPD and because we looked at social integration in communal spaces quite broadly, not just the specific spaces, but also yeah, corridors and entrances. So we quite tried through the SPD to imply sort of the slow move from private, well, fully private within the home and it's a series of becoming more and more public as you go from the corridor to the lift, to the lobby, to the street. So, yeah. yeah, there's scope for privacy. Yeah, and I think, you know, there might be other cultures or countries where they're, they, they are, the social networks are stronger. But, you know, if you look at research in London, the levels of isolation, uh, individual isolation is really high. So I think the GLA conducted a, a, a survey on, you know, whether people had anyone to rely on in a difficult circumstance. And, and the response was really, really sad. So we, we you know, people feel they are isolated. So I think, you know, these, these buildings are good opportunities to try and bring some sense of community. Um, but it requires like resources in terms of the design, but also the management uh, of those spaces. Good. So I think we're coming to the end of our hour. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to Lucia and Becky for uh, sharing this this amazing piece of work with us. Um, I hope it was interesting uh, for everyone. And um, yeah, the, the video will be up uh, on YouTube after the event. But yeah, thank you. Thank you both. And thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.